how does climate change change you? So typically, you might think about climate change as this big global issue. It's abstract. It's scientific, which of course it is. But there's something, some story in there which intersects your life. And to get your climate story, we're really digging out from this network of climate change on one side and your life on the other side. So here are just some examples of some factors that could connect those up, like your personal identity, um, your home place, your emotional responses, your observations of climate change, your family, all kinds of things, right? And from that network, somewhere in there is, is your climate story. Um, a few other concepts which are helpful. Uh, climate story is based on I personal statements. So often it might, be, it might be tempted to say climate change is this, climate change is really scary, which it is, right? So that's not like it's invalid to say climate change is such and such. Um, but for a climate story, you're really looking for phrases like this, right? So I remember this, I feel this, I've observed this. The more you use that type of language, the stronger your climate story is going to be. Um, another really important point that if you've ever taken a writing class, you've, you've learned this, right? It's the show, don't tell concept. And it's really based on our senses. Um, so again, climate change can be very abstract. It's like statistical, it's scientific. But what we want to do is turn it from that abstract idea into something tangible. And the way you do that is through your senses, right? So what does climate change look like? I've heard a lot of stories about, say, forest fires and people smelling the smoke or seeing the flames, right? Or what does the flood water look like in their front yard, right? So very tangible visual or sensory images. And um, the one that really stands out to me is I got to spend some time in a little um, Inuit community called Shishmaref um, on the west coast of Alaska um, a number of years ago. And I was there doing climate stories workshops. It was with a group of high school students. And they were learning about climate change um, primarily because they're really, really, really on the front lines in this little community. Um, it's on a barrier island, so it's right in the ocean. It's a small little strip of land. Um, and it used to be surrounded by sea ice, but because the water temperature has warmed, uh, most of that sea ice doesn't form, or it doesn't form as um, regularly. So once that happens, then you have like big ocean storms that wash right up onto the beach. So it causes a lot of erosion, and at this point, like everyone realized they have to actually move off this island, and so that's in the works. It hasn't happened yet. But really, you know, frontline climate change community. So I knew that I wanted to do some work there with this Climate Stories project, so I just called up a bunch of people there, and they said, hey, can I work here? doing this project, and when the, the science teacher said, yeah, come on, you can, you can work with my kids this, this semester, and I was like, that's awesome, you know. I was like, well, where can I stay? Like, where's the, where's the hotel? And he kind of laughed, he's like, there's no hotels here. <laughs> so he had a cot for me in his science classroom, so I slept in a science classroom for 10 days, which was an experience in and of itself. Um, anyway, so I was talking about climate change uh, on this personal level. I had the students go out and interview people in the community. So mostly it was like their elders, their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents, their parents. And they asked them these kind of questions about like, how do you feel about climate change? What have, what have you observed? Um, and of course, people had a lot to talk about because it's, there's been so much change that's happened. Um, I also did some of my own interviewing. And I think that was the last interview I did was with an Inuit elder named John Sinek, who just had an amazing wealth of detail about the changing climate, changing ice conditions, changing fish populations. Um, it was just incredible, all this amazing genera generational knowledge. Um, but at the, end of his uh, at the end of the interview, he said, you know, I remember when I was younger, when people walked th through the snow, it made like a really sharp, crunchy sound because the snow was so cold and so dry. But now that it's become warmer, like the people walking through the snow doesn't make that sound. It's like a mushier kind of a sound. So I was just like, wow, that's an unbelievable, you know, not an image, but a sensory description of the changing climate, something I never would have thought of, right? And so it really stuck out to me as a great way to, to like describe climate change on this direct sensory level. Um, and I loved it so much, I asked Mr. Sinek if I could use that bit of dialogue in some music pieces, and he said, sure. So, so far I've done two pieces that, um, that use what he has to say. So those are both on the, on the website. So anyway, I'd love to share just a little bit of his interview. Um, this is just about a minute excerpt. So a little bit about our village here. Back when I was young, we, tr we have always had north wind all the time. And we would have blizzards and 
cold north winds for a good month. But but after that, it would be it we would have real nice weathers for at least a month or over a month after that, where people can go out and hunt, uh, hunt, and uh, get ice for drinking water. And it would be like that for a long time. And then when people, it, they, the snow gets so cold and dry that you can hear people walking outside. Um, you could hear their footsteps outside because it, you can hear the crunch real easy on the snow. Nowadays, it doesn't get that hard anymore where you can hear people walking past. The snow doesn't get that hard dry anymore like it used to. Such a powerful way to talk about climate change, you know, and of course he has his whole life growing up in this, this little village, so he knows how things have changed, right? And so I think it's a little, sometimes hard for, for me anyway, because I've moved around, you know, and I think for a lot of us who lived in d different places, it's hard to see all those small changes, but, but they're there, right? So an important point is that everyone has a climate story, right? You don't have to be an Inuit elder. Something in your experience is a climate story. Even if it's a really simple thing about like how you feel about climate change, somewhere in that, in that seed is your climate story. So don't feel like, well, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not an Inuit elder. I don't have a climate story. I guarantee you, you all have a climate story. Um, and just to share a little bit more about what's on the climatestoriesproject.org website, there's a whole bunch of climate stories from all over the world. So if you'd like to, um, at some point after the workshop, go on to the website and just go to the Climate Stories tab, you'll see uh, from, from the Philippines, stories from a lot from the US, um, from Hawaii, from, from uh, Asia, from South America. So it's, it's a growing collection of stories, um, audio stories, video stories. Uh, so it doesn't matter you know, where you're from, your age, your racial background, your gender, doesn't matter. You have uh, something to share. So why is this important? Why should we share our climate stories? Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is that humans are just wired for storytelling. So, you know, I'm a science geek. I, I love data. You know, I like looking at graphs and charts, um, but not everyone does, you know. Um, but we all relate to stories. If you share your story about, you know, things that have happened in your life that are meaningful, people are going to relate to that. And just like, just like that with climate change, we're turning climate change from data like charts and graphs and numbers into lived experience. So people really can relate directly to that lived experience. Um, also as a social movement, storytelling is very, very effective. So we've seen this say with the Black Lives Matter movement where it's not just saying, okay, racism is so bad, you know, but people are saying, here's my experience of racism. You know, that's a personal story and that, that's very, very um, powerful. So just like, just like those movements, now with the climate movement, we can make the same impact with storytelling. All right, so now we'll get into a little bit more of the interactive part. Um, I will be giving three prompts to you, so we're not going to write quite yet, but I just want to set this up so you know where things are going. Um, so I'm going to give three multi-part prompts. I'll go through each one. Um, after that, um, we should have about 15 minutes. I'll keep an eye on the clock um, for you to reflect on the prompts, to write some things down. And just to say, I'll say this a few times, but this is just a start of the process. So it's not an assignment, it's not a quiz, right? You're not looking for anything polished here. So don't like freak out saying, oh my God, I have to write something great. It's just, a pro it's just part of the process, just the beginning of a process. Um, we'll have some time to share with a partner in breakout groups. Um, and then at the end, we'll do a debrief and hopefully some people want to share with the whole, with the whole group. All right, so let's go into these prompts. The first prompt is what do you care about in your home place or community and how is that threatened by the change in climate? Um, so a very important part of climate, effective climate stories is they're grounded in place. So talking about climate change can be hard because it's so big, it's abstract, it's global but we all have some connections to a place that we care about. So it might be where you grew up, it might be where you're living now, it might be your family home, right? Something about that place is important to you and you can think about how is that place um, being impacted right now by climate change or will be impacted in the future. 
Okay, and it doesn't have to be, say, something typically, quote unquote, environmental. So like there's a picture there on the slide of some kids playing basketball in a city, right? Not like an environmental scene, but it might be the case that now it's getting too hot in the summer for your kids to go out and play basketball. That's a place you care about or something that you care about. Um, there's a researcher named Susie Wang who wrote a great paper. She uses the term objects of care about these sort of things of importance to us that we care about uh, related to climate change. I'm, I'm starting to say like subjects of care because object is kind of like distancing, but it's subject of care, right? It's connected to us. It's part of our lives. Um, so it could be a lot, a lot of other things. It could be your children, right? Obviously you care about our children and their well-being. Um, a place to recreate like fishing, it could be a farmer's markets, local agriculture. All of these are objects or subjects of care that you're concerned about, right? What's gonna happen? What is happening to local agriculture, you know, with droughts or with flooding? What's happening to, um, you know, basketball areas where it's too hot? All these things are real tangible experiences. Um, and we connect to climate change through this. We don't care about climate change just because it's climate change. We care about it because it's, impact, it's impacting places we care about, people that we care about. The second prompt is, um, what are your emotional responses to climate change and why do you have those responses? And um, sometimes you might think, you know, with the technological problem, we just need solar energy and we can keep moving on forward, right? And it's just not that simple. I wish it was, right? That would actually be nice. But um, we know, researchers know that we need emotions to make good decisions. So it's not enough just to be, you know, we need to be rational, of course, but we also need to engage our hearts. So like moving, Climate change from an, something we only think about is something that we feel and really feel um, deeply. That's gonna help us make good decisions and connect with other people. So typically it's a, it's a real mix of, of emotions. It's unusual that someone has only one emotion. So I'm sure a lot of you are feeling fear. A lot of you are probably feeling grief. Um, climate grief is a more and more recognized um, phenomenon. Um, I'll say I don't consider these like negative emotions you should try to push away. Right, so embrace that. You know, there's nothing bad about feeling grief about a place that you love being changed by climate change. It's a very natural thing, and it's a, it's something that you should you should honor. Sadness, um, anger is legitimate as well. You know, I talk to a lot of young people that are really pretty pissed off. You know, I, I am too. I mean, we've been we've known about climate change for decades, many many decades, and we know now about fossil fuel companies that have. Um, actively pushed away their own scientific findings, you know, and that really is pretty upsetting. So it's a, it's a legitimate response to, to this whole thing, to be angry. Um, confusion, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Things could turn out better than we expect. You know, there's a lot of choices we have to make as a society. So it's not really clear exactly what things are going to look like, say, in 10, 15 years. Um, hope. You know, hope is something, I think it's complicated. <laughs> I have a slide later talking about the, nest, the like active hope. You know, it's not passive hope. Um, but you might feel hopeful of actually making some pretty cool changes that are needed or excitement, right? So you might think, wow, this is actually kind of cool. We're gonna turn our society around in some pretty amazing ways. And of course, love, you know, it comes back to loving places we care about, people we care about. Um, so I think without love, we don't have much of a chance. So we have to tap into that love as well. Um, and the last prompt is about motivation. So uh, why are you motivated to confront climate change? And what do you envision as a more positive future? And how can you contribute to a positive way uh, forward? Um, you hear a lot of people talk about solutions. You know, what's the solution to climate change? There's nothing per se wrong with that. I tend not to use that term because I think problem and solution is a little too black and white simplistic. You know, I think climate change is definitely with us. Um, it's not going to be solved in, in, in our lifetimes, but we can all do something to advocate or envision or move towards a more positive future. So for me, this, this wording works really nicely. It leaves things open. There's no action that's too small to make a positive contribution, right? Even if it's not going to like solve the climate crisis. So, and motivation is really important because that gets other people on board. Right? A lot of people say, oh, my friends are all climate deniers, or my, my uncle thinks it's all a hoax, right? That's okay. You, know, you can talk to your uncle and say, here's why I care about it. No one can argue with that. You know? And some people would be like, oh yeah, maybe you're right. So motivation is really, really powerful. So why, why are you motivated? You know, tap into that, that inner strength that you have to, to make things move forward. 
Um, how you can contribute can be really, really varied. Maybe you want to get out there and protest. You know, there's definitely a real place for that. You know, there's a place for direct action, tying yourself to pipelines. I don't do that, but I really respect people that do. Um, just talking to people about climate change like we're doing here is a positive way forward. This is part of the process, right? So don't feel like, oh, it's too small. You know, this doesn't really matter. It definitely does. Um, you might be involved with political campaigns, like letter writing is, it can be really effective, um, especially if you incorporate your climate story. So say you write down your climate story and you want to talk to your legislator and say, here's why I care about climate change and here's my climate story. Very effective, right? Um, or working in your community with like sustainability projects, local gardening, uh, solar energy. There's so many opportunities out there to do something to move things forward, as hopeless as it seems and as much of it seems as like a big, big problem, which it is, or a big, big issue, um, it really is. But we all have a role to play that, um, that's positive. All right, so those are the three prompts. Okay, I will put them back up so I don't feel like you have to remember them all. They'll, they'll be back on the screen. Um, so now we're going to start sketching out our climate stories. Um, we'll take about 15 minutes, um, unless I get a signal that we have to cut it shorter, but hopefully we'll have that time. Um, so I think everyone has paper, yes. If you want to do this like on your phone, that's fine too. I tend to like writing on paper myself. So if you're like a writer, writer and you want to actually write word for word, that's fine. If you want to do more like bullet points or brainstorming style, that's also totally fine. Some people like to draw. I've seen some amazing drawings out of this process. So if that's you, go for it. Um, just whatever it is, start with my name is and I am from this place. And uh, focus on what's meaningful for you. I gave you some prompts to work with, but you're like, if you're like, no, I don't want to use those prompts, that's OK, too. OK, this is not a requirement. Um, you're going to have a good climate story if it's something that you care about. So just tap into whatever that is. And your story is not a script. It's a way to process information. So the process of writing your story is really the important part. It's great to like share a great story, but first and foremost, it's about what is it doing inside you to, do, to go through this climate story writing um, process. And you don't need to conform to what I'm calling a hero narratives, right? I think there's a tendency in like Western storytelling to be like, Here's the problem, and then here's how I overcame the problem, and then everything's great. You know? To me, that doesn't really work with climate change. Kind of like I said, it's not, we don't have a solution waiting there for us. And I've been reading a lot about uh, indigenous storytelling, and they have a lot more of this like, cyclical, open-ended structure, and I really like that. You know, this is like what we have to deal with. You know, this is not like a one-and-done kind of a thing. So don't feel like you have to make it sound like you're you have everything wrapped up. You know, if it's messy, if it doesn't feel resolved, that's, that's really OK. And um, certainly, as I said, don't feel pressured to finish anything today. This is just the start of this process. Hopefully, you, you will want to continue, and you'll want to share your story with us on the Climate Stories Project website. So we got a great start today. I heard a lot of awesome things already, but keep going with it, right? You might just spend another hour sketching ideas out, maybe doing a little bit of revisions and things like that. Read it to a friend and say, hey, what do you think? You know, just get some, get some feedback. And don't forget to focus on those sensory details and the, um, and the direct experience. On the website, there's a share your climate story tab that you can share an audio story. Okay, pretty easy to do that. And you have to give permission to, so we can share it and sometimes do some editing. Um, if it's a video story, those are a little bit harder to share. So if you want to do that, just contact me via the website and we can, we can facilitate that. There's five great ways to stay involved with Climate Stories Project. Um, the first one is what I just talked about, of developing and sharing your story on the website. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out um, less regularly than I would like, but it's been about once a month or so. You can sign up right on the website, and you'll learn about um, workshops that are coming up. I do blog posts sometimes, um, featured climate stories. That's all in, in the newsletter. We have a, a Climate Stories Ambassador Initiative, um, and that happens about every three or four months. It's totally online. It's open to anyone all over the world. And so they, you would do what, more or less what we did today of developing our climate story. Um, and then we learn interviewing skills in subsequent sessions. So it's a three-session series. 
Um, so you go out and interview people about their stories. So it's taking it uh, one step further. Um, as I do with my music projects, maybe you have an artistic passion. Maybe you're a painter, or maybe you're into theater. And I'm always encouraging people to use your talents, use your passions for getting your stories out there. So there's a lot of creative ways to do that. You know, digital media, podcasts, you know, there's really no end to, to ways to make your story uh, more accessible. And if you're really excited, you can lead your own workshop. Or maybe you want to have a Climate Stories workshop in your classroom if you're a teacher. Right, so certainly contact me if that's of interest to you. So I'd just like to end with this quote. Um, Hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up, right? Sometimes people just say, we just need to be hopeful, and that's all well and good, but we have stuff to do, right? We have to, to play our part, tap into our motivation. So that's from David Orr, who's a really um, well-known environmental educator and uh, professor. So that's it for me. Thanks, everyone, so much for being here. Thanks to Dr. Perot, um, the Department of Media and Communications, the Bassler Foundation. Obviously, I would not be here without them. Um, who else? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we're yeah. very thankful for you, Jason. So thank you. I just oh, want yeah. to say thank you to Jason and everybody who made time to be here this evening. Um, I know there's lots of things you could be doing today. Um, on a Wednesday afternoon, and I'm very glad that everybody made the time and the space to be here. Please do engage further with the Climate Stories Project. Um, you have already taken the first step to being part of that conversation and being part of this project. Um, the other thing is, Jason received a grant to be here, but he does this mostly on his own time. So, um, you know, it, a lot of what he puts into this um, he does out of just the generosity of, of himself and of his, of his passions. And you can do that also with your passions as students. Um, you know, if you, there's something you learned about today, don't make this the end of your learning experience. Take it into the community and, and give people an opportunity to learn more about it.